Now let's look at applying convolutions to a input, which is not two-dimensional, but three-dimensional. So let's look at the case where we talked about again with an RGB input. So the way I'm going to look at this is this is, let's say, a five by five by one. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and put another five by five by one next to it, and then a final five by five next to that. In our previous example, what we had taken for the black and white case is we took a five by five by one, and we took it through a three by three by one kernel and convolve that into a five by five by one. Okay. Now we're going to actually be taking a five by five by three. And we're going to convolve that and see what happens. If we take our same three by three by one and, 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 and try to apply that, so this is our kernel and we take three by three by one, then let's just look at what would occur. We would take this three by three by one and apply it, let's say, to the top left part of the red face here, right, this slice. And that would be nine multiplications, and we get a result. And then we could do the same thing for the green layer and the blue layer. And notice we're talking about layers here. These I'm going to consider layers, that we have three layers here. Don't get confused with talking about neural networks uh, and layers. The problem with that is that we then would have independent convolutions of the red and the green and the blue. And what if we have a kernel that wants to somehow take into account interactions between green, red, and blue? For example, maybe it's looking, it's going to be uh, looking for some sort of an orange color. So it needs to be getting color information from the red, the green, and the blue layers. So instead of using a 3 by 3 by 1 kernel here, we use a 3 by 3 by 3 kernel. That is, this guy matches this guy. So they equal. So in this case, we have 27 entries in here. And when we do a convolution operation, when we're looking at a particular patch in here, we are taking multiplications, nine multiplications in the red, and then behind that, nine multiplications in the green, and then behind that, nine multiplications in the blue. And we're summing those all together. So we're summing together 27 uh, pointwise multiplications. And we end up with a single number. So we end up with a number here. And then we move it and do the same thing. So we end up with 25 numbers. So we end up with a 5 by 5 by 1. That is important. Every convolution with a single kernel yields us a result, which is, if it's half padding, the same width and height, but takes the depth from whatever it was down to one. And it's important to realize that whatever the depth is of the incoming data, that the kernel has to be that deep. We can have multiple kernels. That's very common. So this might be kernel one. And then we have kernel two which is also a 3 by 3 by 3. And then we might have a kernel 3, which is also a 3 by 3. And we might have a kernel 4, which is a 3 by 3 by 3. Let me give you a, a, a specific example of this. As I'm going through these examples and looking at specific kernels, like for instance a horizontal edge detection kernel, we're not going to actually be writing these kernels. That is, we're not going to be computing the weights. We're not going to be deciding, this is what this kernel's for, this is what this kernel's for, this is what this kernel's for. Instead, the neural network is going to be deciding what is useful kernels and what useful values are in those kernels. Okay? So that's going to be done 
via uh, gradient descent. But it's important to come up with some conceptual idea of why this works. So we're going to look at some specific kernels. We're going to look at a kernel that looks at horizontal lines. We're going to look at a kernel that does vertical lines. These are all fairly simple kernels. We're going to look at kernels that look at diagonal lines, the slope, a positive slope. And we're going to look at a kernel with a slope of negative. Now, I'm not going to give you the weights for these. Just assume, you know, we could, we could write such a thing. So each of these is going to come up with an output. We're going to get an output from here. And this is going to be not to scale, but this is going to be a 5 by 5 by 1. And this is the output from kernel 1. We're going to get an output from here, 5 by 5 by 1. And then we're going to get two more outputs. So we're going to have, this is number 1, this is number 2. We also have 3 and 4. So this one comes from the first kernel, this one from the second kernel, this one from the third kernel, and this one from the fourth kernel. Where are kernels? Kernel 1, kernel 2. I didn't bother putting a label on this one. Let's just call this one kernel 3 and then kernel 4. And that's what they do. Horizontal, vertical, upward sloping, and downward sloping. And what I'm going to try to create I'm going to try to create an octagon detector. So my goal is I want to be able to detect things that kind of look like this. And I'm going to build it from these building blocks. So I'm going to actually use two levels of convolutions. I'm going to take this input, and I'm going to feed it through these four different kernels. And that gives me these outputs. These are often called features. One thing to note about them, though, is they're all the same size, right? As long as we use the same padding for each, we're going to end up with the same size. We know their depth of each of them is 1. We're going to actually go ahead and stack these. So what we're going to do is convert these into a stack that's 5 by 5. In the first stack, we have the output from the first kernel. The second stack is the output from the second kernel. The third stack from the third. And the fourth stack from the fourth. So this depth is 4. Why is this depth 4? So we've got a depth of 4 here because of the four kernels. And that is basically how convolutional layers are going to work in neural nets. We're going to decide how many kernels we want. We're going to decide the size of each kernel. We use 3 by 3, 5 by 5, 7 by 7. All of those are perfectly feasible. And then we will take the output, and that will be the input into the next layer. So this is layer 1 in our neural net. We take the input. We feed it through the kernels, and we get this output. That doesn't actually generate these separately and then put them together. This is all sort of one operation, where it takes each of these kernels, does its convolution, puts it into here. Okay. These are just pulled out intermediate in order for us to conceptualize this. Then we go into layer 2. We're going to probably have a ReLU here, because we want to have some nonlinearity. And then we go into layer 2. Layer 2 now has some kernels. We get to decide how many. We get to decide how big they are and what sort of a padding they are. We're going to go ahead and use one simple kernel. Okay, so here's the kernel we're going to use. We're going to go ahead and feed into one kernel, and it's going to look for, let's just look at how big it's going to be. It's going to be 5 by 5 by 4. Why 4? Because it has to match the incoming here. And so what's it going to do? So the first layer is a horizontal edge detection. So we want a horizontal edge at the top and the bottom. So we're going to go ahead and put a 1 here and here. And we're going to have zeros everywhere else. Our second layer is our vertical layer. So we'd want a 1 here and here. And that's kind of hard to show here, right? But our first layer has 1 and 1 here. Our second layer would have a 1 and 1 here. Our third layer 
which is our slope 1 here, would have a 1 and a 1 here and here. And our final layer would have a 1 and a 1 here and here. So we're going to have 1 and 1, and then a next layer, 1 and 1, and then a next layer, 1 and 1, and then a next layer, 1 and 1. And then uh, in the middle, you know, we'll put something like uh, uh, 2, 4, 6, let's say a negative 8. Just so uh, we'll sort of overall default to 0. If we've got, let's say, all 1's here, then we'll have all of these are fire. We'll get 2 and 2 and 2 and 2 is, is 8, and then we'll go ahead and sort of undo that with a negative. So that's kind of a conceptual idea of how it is we can build up simpler features into more complex features. We'll see some examples later in visualizing what a neural network has learned, that is, what kernels have actually been learned by a neural network and what they're doing. And what happens normally is the earlier layers are representing simpler things, and the later layers are representing more general things. The thing that's worth looking at, if we look, for instance, at this guy here, right in the middle, we might ask how many pixels from our original image affect this pixel here. That is, what is the receptive field? And the receptive field, we just go back and say, what, what pixels affect it. And in this case, it'd be the middle pixel here plus the three surrounding pixels. Sorry, the three surrounding pixels on, on, on each side, so the surrounding eight pixels. So the receptive field would be all nine of these pixels. Anything outside of this can't affect this pixel, but any of these inside can. And then we might ask the same question, right, if we applied this convolution to this input, we would now get what? We would now get a 5 by 5 by 1. By 1? One kernel. Okay? Every kernel always leaves us with a two-dimensional. And if we ask now, what is the receptive field here? Well, that's interesting, because the receptive field here depends on the corresponding pixel in the previous layer, the corresponding value in the previous layer, because these are not pixels, plus the surrounding 8. The surrounding 8, because it's a, our kernel, is a 3 by 3. It's being applied to an input of a 5 by 5 by 4 and generates a 5 by 5 by 1, given that we're using half padding. So the receptive field of this is, with respect to the previous layer, it's actually 8 pixels here. So when we look at the receptive field here, with respect to here, we actually get a total of 9 pixels here. And then the receptive field of those takes us out to the entire 5x5 five five image. So the receptive field of this location at the second layer is the entire image. However, if we go up, let's say, to 2,2 two here, then we would have some pixels at the bottom and the right that would not be part of its receptive field. I did leave off one thing, and that is, when we're doing convolutions, we actually normally add a bias too. So for all these convolutions, we do a summation of these pairwise multiplications, and then we add a bias. So this kernel has a bias, a bias, a bias, a bias, a bias. If we're looking at this octagon detector, how many parameters are there? Well, let's just look. Every kernel, these kernels are 3 by 3 by 3, right? So at this level, we have 27 plus, let's say, 1 for the bias. So this has 28 parameters multiplied by 1 kernel, 2 kernels, 3 kernels, 4 kernels. And at this level, we have 3 by 3 by 4 plus 1. So this is 936, here we have 37, and here we have 28 times 4, 56, 112. So we have a total of 112 plus 37, 149 parameters. That's how many parameters there are to learn here. Let's just consider if we had a fully connected layer. Okay? If we had a fully connected layer, 
right? The number of inputs here is 5 times 5 times 3, so 75. So even if we just had a fully connected layer of size 2 as our first layer, that would be 75 times 2, or 150 weights. And here we have actually gotten to two layers and still been smaller than that budget. And what we've really taken advantage of is the fact that we are moving this kernel around. Why are we doing this? Well, the reason we're doing this is we're taking advantage of the fact that in images we have translation invariance. That is, if you've got an octagon, let's say down here in an image, and you move it up in an image, it's still an octagon. And it'd sure be nice if the machinery we have for detecting octagons doesn't need to somehow totally relearn uh, that an octagon here and an octagon here are the same thing. That is, we don't want to have to have a, a machinery that learns octagons in the lower right corner, and different machinery that learns octagons in the top left, and different octagons in the top right, and different octagons in the bottom left. So we'd like to have our pattern detection be able to work no matter where it is in an image. And that's what these convolutions give us, because the convolutions were doing the same sort of detection anywhere in the image. So these detectors can work anywhere in the image. This octagon detector works anywhere in the image, and so on. What these don't give us is rotation invariance. So if you rotate a little bit, th th these can all be harmed. Uh, for us, if we rotate a little bit, it doesn't really affect our recognition. There is some rotation variance, though. And that is, for instance, if you well, let's say stand on your head, or more likely, if you take an image and turn it upside down, if you look at a face, for example, we are accustomed or programmed to look at faces and understand them right side up. And so if you take an upside down face, it can be hard. It can be hard to recognize who that is. It can be hard to recognize what the emotion is that's being shown on that face, and, and so on. So we don't do well with 180 degree rotation. Even 90 degree rotation can be somewhat difficult. What else do we want to say about convolutions? We just want to remember that we're not writing the weights in these kernels. We're not defining what these kernels are going to do. We are just going to be providing a structure such that a learning algorithm in, an, in this neural network can learn what these weights are. So we will just say we want to have four 3x3 three three kernels. Perhaps that's not going to be enough. How will we know? Our training loss will be high, right? We'll underfit. And so therefore, we might add more kernels at a particular level. So we have the choice of how many kernels at a particular level. We have the choice of how big those kernels are. And of course, as you make the kernels bigger, that increases the number of parameters, the number of weights to learn. And we also can decide the number of layers.